the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the whistler's strange story, The Trigger Man. He was young, brilliant, confident. He had everything it takes to make a successful lawyer. But no matter how you looked at it, law school graduates were a dime a dozen, regardless of how brilliant and confident they were. And Stella and the baby had to eat. So that's why Martin Lane took his first case from Branch Malone, the gambler, and got an acquittal for him, the first of a long line of acquittals. Yes, his old classmates threw up their hands, said he was selling his soul to the devil. But there was good money in it. And he kept telling himself he had to get a start somewhere. So he kept right on getting acquittals for Branch. And the money kept rolling in. But it had to end sometime, Martin. There had to be a payoff eventually. Gentlemen of the jury, have you agreed upon a verdict? We have, Your Honor. How do you find? We find the defendant not guilty. Very well. The clerk will record the verdict of the jury. The defendant is discharged from custody. Jury dismissed for the day. Court stands adjourned till tomorrow. Oh, Mr. Lane. You wanted me, Your Honor? Yes, Mr. Lane. I wanted to compliment you on the way you handled the case. Well, I did my best, Your Honor. It was more than enough. Is that all, sir? Mr. Lane, I know it isn't any uh, business of mine. What's that? There's something I'd like to caution you about. Oh? I don't like to see a clean-cut young fellow like you getting mixed up regularly with an out-and-out -out criminal like Branch Malone. I appreciate your interest in me, Your Honor, but I'm afraid I... You're I'm... not impressed. Is that it? You've got what it takes, Mr. Lane. But I've seen it happen time and again. A boy gets a start, wants to go places, gets mixed up with a criminal crowd, and it's all over. Is that all, Your Honor? Yes, Lane, that's all. Very well. Good day. Good day. Hello, Lane. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Congratulations. Thanks. You know, sometimes I'm sorry I'm on the force. Yeah? Yeah. Fussing around with the small stuff like homicides when I could be doing some great work like you are. Upholding the right. Rushing to defend poor innocent little guys like Branch Malone. Well, there seems to be lecture day at the Hall of Justice. Justice? <laughs> you can buy and sell it like a sack of potatoes. You better run along, Radigan. I've got an appointment. Yeah, yeah, I saw him. Malone the Mighty. He's waiting outside for your payoff. Okay, Radigan. Uh, just a minute, Martin. I got a tip for you about cops. Don't give us the brush off because one of these days you're going to need us. Guys who play bang-bang with the big boys usually do. Suppose we make that our little thought for the day. All right, Martin. All right.
Yes, Martin, you're on your way, aren't you? Another acquittal. Another $500 in your pocket. It doesn't matter much where it comes from, does it? His money's as good as anybody's. And that night, as you sit in the living room reading the paper, you try and reason it through and file it away. But it keeps coming back. Uh, Stella. Yes, Martin? Is anything wrong? No. I thought something might be bothering you. No, there's nothing, Martin. I thought you'd be happy about the case and everything. We can buy that dining room set now. Yes, we can. It was an easy case. $500 for an afternoon's work. It's not bad. No, not bad. Nothing to it. State's evidence was insufficient. One of their witnesses didn't show up. Same as the time before. Yeah. And they found the witness at the bottom of the river three days later. Well, I can't help that. No, I, I suppose you can't. Well, Stella, you're not suggesting I drop him, are you? For years I've sweated and struggled trying to make enough for you and Susan. It's my business to defend him. A lawyer isn't a criminal just because he defends a criminal. That's right, isn't it? You're defending yourself now, aren't you? Oh, now, wait a minute. I'm not going through that again. I've told you a hundred times I'm... I'll get it. Hello? Oh, yes, Branch. What's up? Oh, gee, that's tough. Yeah, sure, I'll be glad to. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure, I'll do it right away. What does he want now? He wants me to meet a friend of his and rush him home. His boy was just run over. Oh, how terrible. Branch isn't so good at this sort of thing. He wants me to tell the fellow and take him home. That's funny. Uh, don't worry, darling. You've just got the jitters. I'll, I'll be right back. Just a little favor for Branch, Martin. It's the least you can do, isn't it? The tavern's only a few blocks away, and you arrive a few minutes later to find Mr. Williams in a booth at the rear. Are you Mr. Williams? Uh, what do you want? I'm sorry. I'm afraid I have some bad news. You are Mr. Williams, aren't you? What's on your mind? Your son. Lenny? Yeah. What's happened? Quick, tell me. Now, try to be calm, Mr. Williams. He's had an accident. What? What are you... Lenny? He was run over. My Lenny? How? How did it happen? That's all I know about it. I'm terribly sorry. Where is he? Where is he? I've got to go to him. He's home. Oh, Lord. My poor Lenny. If I can help you, my car's right outside. Thanks. Come on. Branch, what are you doing here? Little business deal, Martin. All right, Williams, get in. No. No, Branch. I, I'll, get, I'll give you every cent I've got. Please, Branch. I heard that before. Get in. I'll do anything you want, honest. But put that away. Don't make me. I won't, Branch. I won't get in. Suit yourself, Williams. Oh! Get in, Martin. You hear what I said? Get in. You shot him. I said, get him. Uh, I'll take the wheel. You're sitting kind of quiet for a lawyer. I... I can't understand it, Branch. It ain't that complicated for a man with your talent. I put the finger on him. Who was he? I thought I told you, Martin. He's the witness who didn't show up this afternoon. With the prologue of The Trigger Man, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. You hear people say there's a reason for everything. Well, there's certainly a reason why in just 14 years the Signal Oil Organization has grown from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to almost 2,000 dealers serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. Briefly, that reason is quality of product. 14 years ago, it was Signal Oil Company that introduced the first guaranteed anti-knock gasoline at no extra price. And since then, 
Signal gasoline has been constantly improved to give you the benefit of every latest development in the automotive and petroleum industry. In today's new signal gasoline, for instance, the atoms in gasoline molecules have actually been rearranged to create amazing new power. Power that not only helps you enjoy quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter anti-knock performance from your car, but also helps you go farther than ever on each gallon of signal. So you see, there's good reason for the swing to signal. Good reason for you to get acquainted soon with the friendly station in your neighborhood displaying Signal's familiar yellow and black circle sign. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Martin, you've discovered something, haven't you? The judge in Radigan. Even Stella tried to tell you, but you couldn't understand until now. It happened so suddenly that it stuns you. Williams is dead, and you put the finger on him, didn't you? Acted as messenger boy for Branch Malone. Stood by him like one of his gunmen while he pulled the trigger. And there's nothing you can do to make it right again. And nothing you can say to the murdered man's wife or her son or Stella. Martin. Martin, where have you been? It's past midnight. I've been worried sick. It's uh, just a little business, Stella. You'd better go back to bed. What's the matter, I... Martin? You're white as a sheet. Nothing. What was it? Tell me. Nothing, I said. I just had a talk with Branch, that's all. I... Now, go to bed. All right, Martin. I'm sorry. There's only one thing to do now, isn't there, Martin? You're walking down a one-way street, and there's no way to turn back. You're part of the organization now, one of Branch's boys, his counselor, and the only witness living who could put a rope around his neck. And you know exactly how Branch feels about that kind of a witness. So there's nothing to do but keep your mouth shut and hope for the best. You can't face Stella the next morning at the breakfast table. So you leave the house before she wakes and go down to the office. No one's there. You try and concentrate on your work, but it's no use. Go down to the coffee shop and try to eat, but you're not hungry. Walk in the park for a while, over to the library. You can't get your mind off of it, can you? Finally, at 11 o'clock, you return and find your secretary waiting. I've been trying to get you all morning, Mr. Lane. There was a call from Mr. Malone. What? When? About an hour ago. He wants you to see him. All right. Where? At his club? At the Hall of Justice. He was booked this morning on suspicion of murder. What happened, Branch? I thought you might know, Counselor. What do you mean? There was a tip-off last night. What? Yeah. Know anything about it? Oh, now, wait a minute, Branch. Don't look at me. Well, you don't think I... I didn't say nothing. Well, listen, I'd be crazy to do anything like that, Branch. Sure you would. That's what I told Spike. Spike? My trigger man, Martin. Don't believe you ever met Spike, did you? No. Nice guy to have on your side when you're in a spot. We were trying to figure out if any witnesses might have been around last night. Any besides you, I mean. What's the matter, Counselor? Uh, nothing. It's... It's just been a little tough on me, Branch. Sure. Yeah. You know how I feel about witnesses, Martin. Listen, believe me, I'm not going to talk. I won't say anything. That's what I told Spike. What do you mean? And Spike, he said to me, don't worry if they pick you up, boss. Where there's no witnesses, there's no case. You can figure that one out for yourself, Counselor. But, Branch... There won't be any prosecution witnesses, Martin. Because you're the only one. And you ain't going to be on the witness stand. You're going to defend me just like before. Only this time, Spike's going to be real interested in how you're doing. Get it? Lane. Oh, 
Oh, it's you, Radigan. Didn't mean to scare you like that, Martin. A little jumpy, aren't you? What do you want? Get it all settled with a big boy? I heard you just had a chat with him down in his cell. Did he put the heat on? I'm sorry, Radigan. I haven't got time to stand Yeah, yeah, around. I know. You're a busy man. You haven't got time to think about little things. Like a guy suddenly not showing up at home and his wife trying to explain it to his kid. What does your wife think of that, Martin? What does she think when she looks at your kid? Cut it, will you? Okay. Just had to speak my little piece. But I just want to tell you, you're playing with dynamite this time, Sonny. Your friend knows all his blue chips are on the table, and whoever put the finger on Williams in that bar is the guy who's going to hang him. And this time, so help me, the witness won't disappear. What are you getting at, Radigan? I think you know enough about this case to hang Malone, and I think you'll come through for us. And when you do, it's going to be dangerous. Why are you telling me all this? I want you to know why I'm putting a tail on you. What? One of my men's going to watch you day and night, and if you know what's good for you, you won't try and give him the slip. Is this for my protection? Right. Like I said, Martin, this time the witness isn't going to disappear. That puts it up to you, doesn't it, Martin? You can take your choice. Go along with Branch and toss the rest of your life into the ash can. Or tell what you know and face Spike later in a dark alley somewhere. Spike will be there, too, won't he, Martin? And you won't have a chance, because you don't know him from Adam. All you know is that he's never missed yet. That when Branch gives him the order, the witness disappears. You can't eat, you can't sleep. And worst of all, you can't explain to Stella. Martin. Yes? What are you going to do? Oh, will you forget it, Stella? He's my client. I've got to defend him. Do you? Of course I do. Hi, Martin. You know he's guilty. Why must you involve yourself in it further? You've got a right to turn him down. He doesn't own you. Stella, please, will you let me alone? You're an accomplice. If you defend him, you're as guilty as he is. Where are you going? Out. Come on, Joe. We may as well be sociable. I'm sorry, mister. Radigan told me. <laughs> Wonder why he doesn't tell me these things. By the way, my name isn't Joe. What is it? Ed Morris. Okay, Ed. I saw you following me all afternoon. No, I thought you did. I thought I'd walk around the block. That is, if you don't mind. Why not? <laughs> well, your boss would get a bang out of this, I suppose. Walking around together this way. He just said to keep an eye on you. He didn't care how. Is that all he said? That's all. Radigan thinks you're a pretty good kid. So what? Am I supposed to toss away the biggest case of my life just because he thinks I'm a good kid? The guy's guilty and you know it. What do you mean, I know it? If you didn't know it, I wouldn't be here. You better stick to your gum shoeing, Ed. Okay. Hey, there's a bar down the street I don't here. want to go on any bars. Maybe it's just this bar, huh? Maybe because it's the one where William... Did you hear what I said? I don't want to go in any bars. All right, Martin. I've changed my mind about taking a walk. I think I'll go home. Yes, Martin, you're on a one-way street, a blind alley. There's no way to turn now. And there's a blank wall at the end. You've got to take the case. It's more than a matter of right and wrong. Yes, Martin. At this point, it's life or death. So you go to work on it. Visit Branch every day in his cell. Spend nights at the office preparing the case, plugging loopholes, anticipating points the prosecution is sure to bring out, making it another sure thing for Branch. You have two weeks until the arraignment, and Branch wants bail. Two weeks without sleep, forgetting to eat, until you're almost ready to crack. And worst of all, you can't tell Stella. There's no way to make her understand. And then suddenly, on the night before the arraignment, you can't hold out on her any longer. Martin. Martin, darling, you've got to tell me. You can't go on this way. Please, Stella. There's nothing. Are you afraid to tell me? No, I... Why did you lie to me, Martin? Why did you tell me you had nothing to do with the murder? Williams was the man you met that night, wasn't he? Listen, Stella, you've got to forget it. Please, don't even what think... What are you afraid of? I... 
All right, I'll tell you. I'm the witness. I'm the only one who can hang Branch. Radigan knows it. They all do, but they have no proof. That's why that guy's always waiting for me across the street. He's a guard. All I have to do is open my mouth and I'm dead. But if that's all there was to it, I wouldn't worry, see? It's you, too, and Susan. Don't you see? He won't stop at anything. Spike Robertson's waiting for me somewhere, waiting for me to open my mouth. And if I do, the guard won't make any difference. Spike won't stop until he gets us all. Martin, I... Well, now you know it. You were right, all of you. But it's too late now. So you're going to defend him and let it happen again and again? Yes. Martin, I want you to stand up at the arraignment tomorrow and tell them everything. Don't be ridiculous. We'll take our chances, Martin, Susan, and you and I. It has to be that way, dear. If we don't, there's nothing left, don't you see? No, I'm afraid I don't. No. You'd better go on to bed, dear. Yeah, you and me are going to do big things together, Martin. You're a smart boy. Branch. Yeah? Branch, what if I told you that when I get you out of this arraignment and this jam, it was going to be the last time? Huh? That if I get you out of this one, we're all washed up. What do you mean, if, Martin? All right, when I get you out of this one. How long you been thinking this over? Oh, I don't know. Because I don't I just... like it, Martin. You just don't run out on this kind of a partnership. Not when a guy knows as much as you do. Well, I'm not going to talk if that's what's worrying you. Oh, you're wrong, Martin. I ain't worried. And okay, it's the last time if you want it that way. Of course, you won't be taking cases from anyone else either, but uh, if you say it's the last time, there's nothing I can do, but... What do you mean, Branch? I ain't in charge of ending partnerships, Martin. I leave that up to Spike. So you go into the courtroom, Martin, and half the prosecution as you think about the one-way street with Spike waiting at the end. Stella is there watching you, her face white and tense. Branch, confident, half-smiling. The rest of them, Radigan, the judge, the jury, all looking at you, waiting, wondering what you'll say when the time comes. And then finally it comes, and you find yourself on your feet, going into your act. I remind the court that the so-called evidence presented by the prosecution is neither circumstantial evidence, nor is it direct evidence. It's nothing, gentlemen, but suspicion, based simply on the fact that it is alleged that my client had ample and sufficient motive to... to... She's not looking at you now, Martin. She's bent over, her face in her hands. Radigan is turning away. The judge is looking down at the bench. Uh, William's connection has yet to be demonstrated to the satisfaction of either the state or... or... I can't go on, Your Honor. I ask that the court disqualify me as counsel for the defense and offer myself as principal witness for the prosecution. Oh. <laughs> Martin! Oh, Martin, darling! I knew you'd do it, kid. I knew it. Thanks, Radigan. Thanks. It's a new world, isn't it, Martin? There's a different feel to the sidewalk under your feet as you start home late that night after filing your statement with the district attorney's office. The streets are bare and deserted. Just you and Ed Morris, Radigan's guard. Well, I missed you when I left the courthouse, Ed. I was there, don't worry. It looks like you've got a job on your hands now. I'm ready. That was quite a thing you pulled. I thought Malone was going to pass out in his chair. <laughs> ah, you know, it's funny, Ed. But now that it's over, I'm not scared at all. They sent two men along with your wife. Stake out at your house, you know. Yeah. Is this the car? Yeah. Hop in. 
Spike. Yeah, that's right. Spike. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question. How much longer will your car last? Well, the answer to that question depends pretty much on the care your car gets. That's why the extra care of signal double-check lubrication is really more important to you now than ever before. You see, when your signal dealer lubricates your car, in order to make doubly sure that not a single part can be missed, he uses the famous signal check chart on which the maker of your car shows every lubrication point. And your signal dealer checks each point against this chart not just once, but twice to make double sure. What's more, he uses nine special types of signal lubricants. So each part on your car gets the exact type of protection it needs. Yes, there is a difference in a signal double-check lubrication. A difference that can spell longer, trouble-free miles for your car. If it's been a thousand miles or two months since last lubrication, there's no better life assurance you can give your car than to drive into one of the friendly stations displaying signals yellow and black circle sign for a signal double-check lubrication. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Martin, Branch didn't waste any time, did he? Two shots, and your guard lies dead at your feet. You look at the killer standing in front of you, the gun still smoking in his hand. There's nothing you can do, no way to turn. Ten, maybe fifteen minutes left to live. Long enough for him to take you to a lonely spot on the highway and make another witness disappear. Then, strangely, you find yourself thinking of the deposition, safe in the district attorney's office. And, stranger still, you discover you still aren't afraid. No use checking him, he's dead. Yeah. I don't miss very often. Oh, what do we do now? Well, maybe we better get in the car and hustle him over to the morgue. What are you talking about? That's what we usually do with the stiffs. But I don't get it, Spike. Spike? Yeah. Uh, you know Radigan was putting a tail on you, didn't you? Well, sure I did, but... That's me, Stanley, DA's office. The guy in the gutter you've been palling around with for two weeks is Spike. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen, written by Harold Swanton from an idea by Robert and Beatrice Gruskin, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.